Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Guidewell Connect Insights Lounge. We're here at day three, the final day of the AHIP Institute and Expo. My name is Kate Warnock, and we have our final distinguished guest, Dr. Sachin Jain. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Jain, you are, of course, the CEO of Caremore Health System, and I uh, know that you had a very early start, so appreciate your time being here. It's great to be here. All right. Yeah. So let's get into your questions. Um, you know, obviously, Dr. Jane, we know that the, the health industry has to do more to identify and assist people who suffer with multiple chronic conditions. How have you advanced this outreach at Caremore? Yeah, so I think it's important to take a step back and think a little bit about who our high-cost, high-need patients are, who our complex patients are. And um, I think someone earlier today referred to it um, as you know, being similar to, to pornography. You know it when you see it, but you do, it's really hard to kind of actually define. And I, I thought that that was actually really apt because um, most patients probably don't self-identify themselves as complex. Um, I have parents who, between the two of them, have uh, uh, congestive heart failure, 11 stents, a, a pacemaker, diabetes, uh, cancer, uh, a rheumatologic disease, and they probably wouldn't self-identify themselves as being complex patients. Mm -hmm. And so I think the ultimate need for the healthcare system is for us to be able to accurately identify who these patients are, and then frankly build systems of care that actually meet their needs and address their needs. Um, one of the things that we're really proud of at Caremore is that we start with this assumption that all patients actually are a little bit different and have different needs. And patients who have early chronic disease need a system of care that actually works proactively to prevent progression of that right. chronic disease right. into you know, some of its full-blown end-stage manifestations. So you know, the example is you know, early hypertension turns into kidney failure if it's unmanaged, um, or diabetes turns into retinopathy if, if it's unmanaged. And so I think that the, the, there's a significant need for us working in the healthcare industry focused on the needs of complex patients to be able to really accurately identify, you know, who these patients are, um, both, you know, from their their you know their their subtleties of their presentations, but also kind of significant things like hospitalizations and and um, and so we've built a, a system that I think works on both ends of it. Um, we try to identify patients early in chronic disease uh, and and actually slow their progression to some of these end stage complications. But if we have patients with some of those end stage complications, um, we have a model of care that really focuses on staying close to patients. Um, we've reinvented roles within our system. We have um, extensivist physicians who actually follow our patients from the hospital to post-discharge follow-up. Um, and so, you know, in these acute episodes where patients really need high touch, um, they need engagement with the family, you need involvement of the primary care doctor, you need a, a physician who's able to really understand the complexities of taking care of these patients and then, you know, coordinate all of that activity. And so I think we've, we've really pioneered this new role, the extensivist physician. Um, and then we also have chronic disease management centers and, that are based in people's communities mm -hmm. that are really easy to access, uh, that have um, you know, uh, uh, multidisciplinary teams who actually follow patients uh, through their, uh, their, their illnesses. Um, and we also have innovations like a senior-friendly gym that, uh, that kind of encourages patients to stay active and engaged. Um, we have, you know, selective use of digital health technologies like remote monitoring tools mm -hmm. to actually be able to stay close to, you know, some of our most frail patients um, who we're not able to see as often as we like, but who we'd like to stay, you know, really in close contact with. So it's, it's really about the system of care, but at, at, the, at the foundation of it is, is the caring caregiver and the caring clinician. Um, and, you know, we, we think really hard about how do we engage our workforce to make sure that they're able to really take care of these patients and give them the love that they need. And I think that's the, that's the really hard part in this, in this line of work. You know, Dr. Jane, in studying uh, Caremore to, to prepare for this interview, you know, I'm, I'm very aware that your business model also includes the caregiver. Mm -hmm. So it's not just necessarily the, the member that you have enrolled in your plan, but you understand the role and the, the, uh, the opportunity to better engage the caregiver to make sure that that compliance happens, that that, you know, that treatment really does continue in the right direction. Yeah, I think the real, I think, significant piece of it is, is actually we've built a model of care that actually provides clinicians time with patients. Mm -hmm. um, I think we get so focused in 2016 on consumerism and we get so focused on technology that we forget that, you know, 
real connection with patients is actually made when we actually spend time with them. Mm-hmm. And so our system of care, whether it's you know the, the staffing ratios for our extensivists to our patients or um, how our, our, our CCCs, our, our, our community-based care centers are actually uh, structured, is to make sure that we are actually delivering a high-touch experience for the patients who need it the most. And certainly that helps to build that relationship, that loyalty, and then they come to you instead of perhaps waiting for something to, to grow more acute. Uh, they're, they're willing because they've already established that's, that relationship. You know, that's exactly it. I mean, I, I, one of the things that we, we try to do is actually make sure that we're thinking hard about the unmet needs of our patients mm-hmm. and, um, and actually bring things into our care centers that, that are attractive for our patients. So for instance, you know, one of the early insights uh, that you know, Caremore's early docs had was that a lot of a lot of senior patients actually have difficulty uh, with toenail clipping, mm-hmm. um, and so we have a toenail clipping clinic that actually serves number one as an opportunity for us to check their foot health right. um, to prevent you know small nicks and bruises from turning into ulcers, um, but it also gives us an opportunity to actually see them, and uh, if they come in you know for their toenail clipping, um, it gives us a chance for us to actually check their hemoglobin A1C or uh, or engage them about some other chronic disease uh, pro- that they that they have. Um, another, I, I think, thing that we've we've started to introduce is actually dental in uh, in our care centers. And you know, this came out of conversations with patients. I you know, every month have lunch with some of our patients uh, just to hear what they care about. And the reality is that a lot of senior patients care more about their dental health than they do about their physical health. And so if we're able to bring them into our care centers for dental care, um, then we might be able to actually manage their primary care needs. So we're constantly thinking about ways to actually engage patients more and, and, and solve the problems that they have, but in the process then identify some of their unmet medical needs and actually solve some of their problems. You know, so you're speaking, Dr. Jane, to something that we, we just had Dr. Joe Selby, the executive director mm-hmm. of, of PCORI, sure. and was describing to us, you know, um, I was asked the question was, what can health plans learn from the very patient-centered approach that, that, his, uh, that his institute manages? And he said, don't be afraid to talk to the members, pull them in. And so here you are sitting down with them and hearing firsthand. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, I sat down with one of our patients um, in the hospital and I asked him, you know, he was a patient with COPD, and I said, hey, are you a member of our COPD program? He said, no. And I said, do you use our senior-friendly gyms, our Nifty After 50s? And he said, no. And I said, why? Um, he says, well, I can't get there. Transportation's a problem for me. Um, and I said, well, Caremore has provided transportation to uh, its members for as long as you know, we've, we've existed. And um, you know, he t- turned to me and he says, well, have you ever you know, taking the rides that you actually, you know, order for your patients? And I said, no. I says, well, I have. And um, when uh, you guys are on time, when uh, you pick me up because you've scheduled it and your, your drivers will show up on time, but then the appointment length is actually unpredictable. And so you have to then order the pickup after the appointment is over. Okay. And on time in the medical transport industry is actually um, within one hour. And it got me... And, and folks on our, on our team really thinking hard about you know, this issue of, yes, you can provide transportation, but if you have a frail senior waiting outside your care center for a ride for an hour, they're asking un- for trouble. They're, you're asking yes, for, for trouble, trouble. And, they're, yeah. and they're actually unlikely to come to the care center ever right. again because, because that experience of actually having to wait for a ride. So it's one of the reasons we've actually partnered with Lyft um, to actually be able to provide just-in-time medical transportation um, to our members and and shorten those wait times so that they're waiting five or eight minutes um, instead of waiting an hour. And um, we think that that's going to you know, solve one of the basic problems that people have in accessing healthcare. One of the hidden problems that I think people have in accessing healthcare, which is, you know, adequate transportation. Well, and, and again, you, it, it really resonates, uh, you know, this, this very concrete example of, um, you know, listening to what the needs are and don't assume, uh, you know, that you're delivering on a benefit until you've, you've really gotten the feedback. So, um, so certainly kudos to you for, for taking the time. No, to, to thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, our next question for you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jane, is, you know, you wrote recently in Forbes about healthcare's four forgotten virtues. How are you influencing your peers on balancing the human side of medicine with the promise of digital health? Yeah, I think it's really important to have a mature conversation in our country about digital health. Um, Jim Madera, the president of the AMA, recently called uh, digital health the snake oil of our generation. And it kind of prompted me to actually look deep into the history of the word uh, of, of the term snake oil. Yeah. And what I found was that the original snake oil um, what was came from the Chinese water snake and actually worked really, really well huh. uh, on select medical problems. It worked for 
um, arthritis and arthralgias. And so, you know, it was it was actually uh, traded between uh, workers on the uh, on the transcontinental railroad. Um, a lot of those rail, war, railroad workers came from China, and they brought water snake oil with them. And over time, what happened was the water snake oil got replaced with rattlesnake oil, oh, and rattlesnakes wow. are actually less rich in omega three acids okay. than water snake oil. Bear with me for a second. I know this is getting getting a little <laughs> long. Um, and then and then what happened is that. You know, a group of entrepreneurs started calling, started putting turpentine and turmeric powder and red and 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 uh, cayenne peppers together to create snake oil that didn't contain any snake oil. Right. And I think the same thing about digital health. Hmm. I think um, we we di- the when digital health is used for the right patients for the right problems in the right settings, it's it can be an awesome solution. Um, and um, when it it's used in other settings without, you know, carefully targeting the right solutions. Um, it can be a disaster, and we see that playing out, you know, within the care more health system. So we have a remote monitoring program um, where we actually follow our patients uh, from when, when they're when they're um, when they when they progress in their chronic diseases to the point where they become difficult to manage. We actually outfit them with monitors. Um, but the real reason that those remote monitoring programs actually work is that on the other end of the remote monitor is a caring clinician. And so, you you know, we we tend to oversimplify how things work. Um, We say, oh, we just deployed X, Y, and Z technology and it worked. It's not just the technology. It's the technology embedded in a system of care where, um, where, where you're actually able to solve the problems that patients really have. And so I think, you know, one of the lost virtues that I talk about is the lost virtue of great clinicians. And, you know, we've, we've gone away from talking about clinicians as clinicians, and instead we call them providers. Um, and what I think that we're doing in the process is we're commoditizing medical care. And any of us who ever gets sick never really thinks about, uh, you know, hey, I just want to see a provider. Somebody wants to see a great, caring clinician. That's what, that's what we all want for ourselves. And so I think the virtue that I identify there that I really, I think, support within CareMore, and I think that CareMore embraces wholeheartedly is this whole virtue of great clinicians taking great care of patients, enabled by technology when it's selectively applied to solve problems. And so it's, it, you know, we, we can never give up this notion that great clinicians are necessary to actually take great care of patients. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I, again, I think what you say really resonates. You know, we had obviously in this expo area, the, uh, the AHIP Institute and Expo, uh, so many um, tremendous health solutions. Uh, you know, we had many of the, the founders and, and CEOs in our Insights Lounge, and uh, they all spoke to the need to really understanding not just being a point solution, but understanding where they fit and how they can help enhance maybe an existing process uh, so that their M, their digital their digital health solution uh, really was that perfect fit, um, you know, to, to help solve something. So I think that that's the point you're making is that you know this technology can't just be snake oil. It can't just be the promise of something if it's not integrated in a meaningful way. It's got to be water snake oil, not right. rattlesnake right. oil. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. <laughs> right, for sure. All right. So, you're you're going to make me rephrase my next question because I actually use the word provider, but I will change that. So, in your career, you have no doubt seen the relationship between the payer and the clinician changed drastically. What other joint opportunities might be explored by these two parties? Well, I, you know, one of the neat things about CareMore is that we're both payer and provider. And I think that the integration of both payer and provider creates incredible opportunities um, to be able to, you know, actually um, unlock solutions to unmet medical need. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that Leba Lesson, our, my predecessor as CEO of CareMore, used to say um, is that prepayment is freedom, not risk. Um, capitation is freedom, not risk. And I think that it's that mindset shift that, um, you know, we have to take as an industry around actually um, seeing, you know, these risk-based opportunities as opportunities to really do what what patients really need and what the system really needs. Tremendous. Okay. All right. Our final question for you, Dr. Jane. Where do you see the health industry and the health consumer we serve five years from today? Yeah, I think we will have a much more mature view of consumerism than we do today. I think the view of consumerism that we have in our industry right now is really shaped around um, the problems of people between the age of 30 and 50 um, around staying well. And so a lot of the talk around consumerism right now is about how do I choose, you know, how do I become a better Choose, uh, consumer of healthcare services and make good choices about my about where I get my healthcare. Um, 
how do I shop effectively for healthcare services? I, I think that's the wrong model of the healthcare consumer. Most sick people, let's just stop calling them consumers, we'll call them sick people, just want to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you think about great experiences in the retail sector, you think about um, organizations that actually proactively identify your, your needs and actually manage to those needs. Mm -hmm. And in healthcare, we don't have that mindset necessarily. I think we have bits and pieces of that mindset. Um, and, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm very worried actually that we're getting to a place you know, where we're talking a lot about consumer-directed healthcare and we're talking a lot about choice and we're talking about empowering consumers. And I, I take a slightly different view of that, which is that most sick people want to have, have di very different levels of desire to engage in making choices in their care. And I think we need to have a much more sophisticated and more nuanced view of the healthcare consumer. Um, it, you know, buying healthcare is not like buying a mattress, you know, at Sleepy's on a on a Monday afternoon, you know, Memorial Day. It's a it's it's a much more personal experience, and it's something where, ultimately, I think most people would like to just have the confidence when they go to a healthcare provider organization that they're going to get the right care um, and that the right things are gonna happen for them and that they don't have to worry about them. Right. And unfortunately, we're getting to a place right now in the dialogue around consumerism where, we, where we're encouraging patients and family members to worry about things and to make choices about things that in fact the system should actually just anticipate and help you manage through. And um, I think we will get there. I mean, I think, you know, uh, I think this is an industry with lots of really smart and very talented people. So we're gonna get there, um, but I'd like us to get there faster because, um, because I have patients who are, you know, I have patients who, who need us to get there and I have you know, parents who uh, fundamentally need a healthcare system that actually anticipates their needs and solves their problems um, and, not, and doesn't just kind of you know, treat them like they need to be healthcare shoppers who are shopping for, right. for you know, any other consumer good. Right, so. right. Well, so then all the more fortunate then to uh, have care more health system be the beacon that it is and, and really the, the exemplary model of anticipating those needs and delivering on them too, so. We're trying, we're trying. It's, right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey of, uh, of a thousand miles. So, right, yeah. well, Dr. Sachin Jane, thank you so much for joining us here at the Guidewell Connect Insights Lounge. My name is Kate Warnock. Thanks so much for watching. Terrific, thank you very much. Thank you.